Good evening. Earlier this, this afternoon, I had purple hair. <laughs> My grandchildren are visiting. So. But I did take a shower, so you are lucky that I don't have purple hair. But before we begin, I do want to thank our sponsors for this evening's program, and that is the Town of Barnesville has a tourism grant that they give to nonprofits every year, and we were fortunate enough to get one this year. So thank you, Town of Barnesville, and also Lizzie McGuire, Magruder. <laughs> So this evening we have Eric J. Dolan, who is the author of 15 books, including Le Levithian, The History of Whaling in America, which was chosen as one of the best nonfiction books of 2007 by the Los Angeles Times and the Boston Globe, and also won the 2007 John Lyman Award for U.S. Maritime History. His most recent book, Before Rebels at Sea, which is this evening's topic, was A Fur Furious Sky, and we were fortunate enough to have him last year um, presenting that one. That one is about the 500-year history of America's hurricanes, which was a Kirkus Prize finalist and chosen as one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post, Book List, Library Journal, and the editors at Amazon. It was also selected as a must-read book by the Massachusetts Center for the Book for 2021. Prior to A Furious Sky, he published Black Flags, Blue Waters, The Epic History of America's Most Notorious Pirates, which was chosen as a must-read book for 2019 by the Massachusetts Center for the Book and was a finalist for the 2019 Julie Award, Howe How Award, uh, given by the Boston Authors Club. He's a graduate of Brown, Yale, and MIT, where he received his PhD in environmental policy. Mr. Dolan lives in Marblehead with his family, and I'd like to welcome Mr. Dolan. And um, do you mind, um, Ms. Kathy, do you mind turning down the lights? Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. I'm happy to be back here. I remember when I came to speak about A Furious Sky, it was in the midst of, or still in COVID, but it was a very different experience. Almost everybody was wearing masks, and this was the first talk that I gave that wasn't a Zoom talk, and then we went right back to Zoom talk, so I'm glad people uh, came out tonight, and I hope you enjoy yourself. Before I got here this evening, I went to the Lothrop Cemetery? What a beautiful cemetery. And I couldn't believe it. There are some, uh, some tombstones in there from the late 1600s, including one from 1697 for a two-year-old child who passed away. I will make one pitch. If anybody here is from the local historical society, you need to get a, uh, what's, what's the word today, uh, a angel investor to give you a small amount of money so you can go in there and get that lichen off those tombstones, which is destroying them. I just, they, so many of the tombstones are entombed in lichen, and it's so easy to get it off. But anyway, that's just me, the historian, speaking, because I'd love to have those things available uh, in the future. So thanks for inviting me to Tales of Cape Cod, and uh, thanks for coming out. Now, it was late in the day on June 3rd, 1780, when Salem privateer Captain Jonathan Harriton and his privateer, the Pickering, were heading for the friendly port of Bilbao, Spain. And Bilbao, of course, at this time was an ally of the Americans. The British privateer Achilles, however, stood in the way. And nobody would have faulted Harridan had he fled in the face of his superior foe. While the Pickering had a crew of 38 men and 16 cannons, the Achilles bristled with 130 men and 43 cannons. Hardly a fair fight, but that's not how Harridan saw it. He relished the chance to confront the enemy and strike a blow for the revolutionary cause. Turning to the British prisoner who had informed him of the Achilles' might, he said, I shan't run from her. And he didn't. As the Achilles began its advance, Harridan told his men that though the Achilles appeared to be superior to them in force, he had no doubt that they should beat her off if they were firm and steady and did not throw away their fire. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, in Bilbao, word quickly spread that there was about to be an epic battle between a British ship and an American ship just offshore, and more than a thousand people rushed to the beach to watch the spectacle. Sort of like uh, rubbernecking on the highway. Now, booming broadsides and musket fire filled the air. One of Harridan's crew said that while shot flew around him, Harridan was as calm and steady as amidst the shower of snowflakes. The battle raged for more than two hours, and then Harridan ordered his men to fill the cannons with bar shot. Bar shot is essentially two cannonballs that are connected by an iron rod. And when that comes out of the cannon, it starts spinning wildly, and it can shred rigging, sails, or even smash a mast or a spar if it hits it head on. These projectiles were absolutely devastating, and they destroyed a lot of the Achilles' superstructure. Having had enough, the Achilles turned and fled with the rebel commander close behind. But despite its injuries, the Achilles was a little bit too fast and got away. So Harridan spun about. He reclaimed the Golden Eagle, which is a privateer ship, a British privateer, that he had captured earlier on that the Achilles had briefly taken back. All told, one of Pickering's crew had been killed, his head sheared off by a cannonball. And I have to tell you, in reading a lot of these accounts, there were quite a few men who had their heads sheared off by cannonballs. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and eight men were seriously wounded. We have no idea how many people, or I have no idea how many people were wounded or killed on board the, uh, the Achilles. Now, I want to tell you a brief story about this plaque. This is the top third of a much lar a larger plaque. It's about three feet wide by about four or five feet tall. And while I was researching the book, I had heard about this plaque, which basically honors Harridan's exploits. And uh, I was told, uh, the, the, one of the sources that I read said that the plaque was in Salem, Massachusetts, which is right next door to Marblehead, where I live. And it also said that it was in the same uh, four-corner area where the Salem Witch House is, that black house that you might have been to if you've been to Salem. So I hopped on my bike and I went over to Salem looking for this plaque. I looked in vain. I found a bunch of other historic plaques, but not this one. So I got home and I called a local historian and I said, what happened to Harridan's plaque? And she said, uh, you might get a kick out of this. It is in a Korean barbecue restaurant down the street. <laughs> How? <laughs> How it got there, nobody has any idea. And uh, so I hopped back on my bike, and I went back to Salem. And this is in the midst of COVID. So I walked into the restaurant, and the woman there was very excited because they had no customers, and they thought I was there to get some food. Uh, I said, unfortunately, I'm not here for food. I probably should have bought something. I said, I'm here to take a look at that plaque, which is behind your head. It was right behind uh, where in old-fashioned terms, the cash register would have been, but her computer was. And I think that that plaque and its placement in a Korean barbecue restaurant is emblematic of how privateering has been treated in American history. <laughs> now, now Harridan remained in Bilbao for two months before heading back to Salem. On the return voyage, the Pickering captured three more British prizes. To honor their intrepid captain, the owners of the Pickering gave him this silver tankard and two identical silver mugs inscribed with the image of the Pickering and his initials. And I tell you a sort of a funny story, since my wife's not here. Uh, this is owned by the Peabody Essex Museum, which is uh, where my wife and I were married. We were married there in 1995. We were the first wedding ever in the Peabody Essex Museum back when it was cheap. Now it's a full-scale business, and they have weddings every weekend. But my wife was at a talk I gave about a month ago, and I mentioned that Peabody Essex Museum, because a lot of people in the audience were very familiar with it. And I said, yeah, we were married back in, and I said, Jen, was it 1994 or 95? <laughs> that did not go over very well. <laughs> anyway, uh, during his tenure in the Massachusetts Navy and as a privateer, Harridan took many prizes and brought back hundreds of British cannons and as many British prisoners. When he died at the age of 59 in 1803 of tuberculosis, his obituary in the Salem Gazette lauded him as one of the most able and valiant naval commanders that the war had produced. The Pickering was one of nearly 2,000 American privateers, and Harridan was one of tens of thousands of privateersmen who served during the Revolution. 
Privateers were armed vessels owned and outfitted by private individuals that had government permission to attack enemy ships during times of war. That permission came in the form of a letter of mark a formal legal document issued by the government that gave the bearer the right to seize vessels belonging to belligerent nations and bring them home to have them adjudicated to determine whether or not they were a valid British prize and then they would become the spoils of war. The proceeds from the auction of these prizes were in turn split between the men who crewed the privateers and the owners of the ships. Now, despite the contributions made by Harridan and tens of thousands of privateersmen, many believe that privateering was a sideshow in the war. Privateering has long been given short shrift in histories of the conflict. Rebels at Sea fills that void by uh, providing a comprehensive account of privateering that demonstrates that it was critical to winning the war. American privateersmen took the maritime fight to the British and made them bleed in countless daring actions against British merchant ships and not a few British warships. Privateers caused British maritime insurance rates to rise precipitously, diverted critical British resources to protecting their own vessels and to attacking American privateers, added to British weariness over the war and contributed to bringing France into the war on the side of the Americans, which was a key turning point in the conflict. On the domestic front, privateering brought much needed goods and military supplies into the new nation, provided cash infusions for the war effort, boosted coastal economies through the building, outfitting, and manning of privateers, and bolstered America's confidence that it might win in this quixotic war against the greatest power on Earth. Now, thousands of books have approached the revolution from virtually every single angle. Rebels at Sea places privateersmen, most of whom were not famous or even well-known individuals, at the very center of the war effort. It demonstrates that when the United States was just a tenuous idea, they stepped forward and risked their lives to help make it a reality. In fighting against the British on the open ocean, the Americans relied on four separate military forces. Whoops, there were state navies, Washington's secret navy, which operated for only about a year near the beginning of the conflict, the Continental Navy, and privateers. Of these four, privateers were by far the most numerous and the most effective. They captured in the vicinity of 1,600 to 1,800 British ships worth many millions of pounds. Now, Massachusetts, where I'm from, and many of you are probably from, we like to boast or think Massachusetts has been the first in a lot of things, and that's true, and it was also the first in privateering. It was the first colony to authorize privateering in November of 1775. The importance of, Mass of, Ma of the Massachusetts Privateering Act in unleashing privateering in the colonies became even clearer in hindsight. Some 40 years later, John Adams, who was a big proponent of privateering and the Continental Navy, would write that the passage of the Massachusetts Act is one of the most important documents in history. The Declaration of Independence is a trifle in comparison with it. And I think during the war, that is accurate. Since then, I would have to give the Declaration of Independence a little bit of an edge. <laughs> now, New Hampshire and Rhode Island followed suit in early 1776 with their own privateering statutes. And at the same time, pressure was growing on the Continental Congress to launch privateering on a colony-wide basis to fight back against the British. And they did so on March 23rd of 1776. They passed the privateering resolution into law. Now, with their capital tied up at the docks, American ship owners eagerly, eagerly pursued privateering. After all, prizes that were brought in could be sold, the ship and its cargo, to generate some profits. Many men invested in privateers. Indeed, privateering spurred a speculative frenzy within the colonies. It was sort of like an early version of cryptocurrency. Everybody wanted to get in on the act. And among the more illustrious speculators was General George Washington, who appropriately, appropriately enough invested in a privateer called the General Washington. 
I'm sure he didn't have a hand in naming it because he would have been mortified. He hated to get attention focused on him publicly, but privately he loved it. So anyway, General, just Generals Nathaniel Green and Henry Knox, as well as Paul Revere, also invested in privateering ventures. Now, privateer captains would often be known to the merchants by virtue of their past employment. And they would be, receive the largest number of shares of any prize that's taken. Now, take a good look at this guy. I was writing this book in 2021, 20, 22, 20, yeah, 2021. 20, My daughter, who's now a junior literary agent in New York City, was home because of COVID. She had to leave her apartment in New York City. And she was 22 at the time. And when I saw this picture, I invited her into my office. And I said, take a look at that. He was a privateersman. And Lily took a good long look at him. And she said, you know, Dad, I could get into privateering. <laughs> <laughs> so a good looking guy. <laughs> now, while crewmen were sometimes known by the owners pri prior to being hired, in most cases, they were not. And they had to be invited down to join the privateers. Now, what was usually used is something called the hearty welcome. The owners would put ads like this in local newspapers, inviting men to the local pubs where they would get absolutely smashed and uh, sign the articles of agreement. Um, I, I have to admit that that's not so unusual. They would have joined anyway because they were hopefully, they were in search of making money as well as uh, helping out with the patriotic cause. But if you read a lot of colonial history, what you quickly realize is that most people were mildly inebriated most of the time because they didn't drink regular water for fear of contamination. Now, black men served on many privateers. Some were freemen. One of those was the Philadelphian James Fortin, who signed on to the Pennsylvania privateer Royal Lewis at the age of 14. Now, why did a young black man, a freed black man, uh, sign up for the patriotic cause. There were two reasons in his case. On July 8th of 1776, the Declaration of Independence was writ read aloud in a square in Philadelphia. And James Fortin, who was 10 years old, heard that reading. And he heard the ringing words of the Declaration of Independence. And he thought maybe those words, all men are created equal, applied to him. And then four years later, Pennsylvania passed the first abolition of slavery law in the colonies. It was only a gradual abolition of slavery law. If you are currently a slave, you are not freed, but your children were freed when they reached the age of 28. And those two events caused James Fortin to decide that he was going to throw in his lot with his fellow Americans. His job was to bring gunpowder from the ship's magazine to the cannons. The first cruise was a triumph. They captured seven prizes, brought them back to Philadelphia. Unfortunately, there were a number of injuries on board, including three of the men who were at the cannon station that James Fortin was supplying. A cannonball ripped through the side of the ship and killed all three of them, but Fortin survived. When he came home, he gave some money to his parents, and he signed up for another cruise of the Royal Lewis. He shouldn't have been so eager in hindsight because barely a day out of the Philadelphia port, the Royal Lewis got captured by the HMS Amphion, Captain John Baisley. Now, Fortin was petrified because he knew that men of his complexion who were captured by British ships during the American Revolution would usually be taken to the slave marts in the Caribbean or other places. So he feared that was going to be his fate. But fortunately for him, Captain Baisley had a 12-year-old son on board. And for whatever reason, he chose Fortin to be his son's companion. And for the next four to five weeks before the ship pulled in to New York City, they got along very well. So right before uh, Baisley was about to discharge all the men of the Royal Lewis and have them placed on the British prison ship Jersey, he gave Fortin a choice. He said, you can either go to England with my son and be his ward, you will be free, you'll have money, and you'll be educated, or you can go with the rest of the men on the Royal Lewis to the prison ship Jersey, which is a horrible end for most people. He said, I am going to go to the Jersey. I am going to stick up for my country, and he did. He went there, and he lasted eight months before being traded in a prisoner exchange. 
And then after the war, I think one, one of Fortin's most interesting sections of his life was that after the war, he became a leading sailmaker in Philadelphia. When he died in 1842, he was worth an estimated $70,000. And he never gave up hope that his new country that he fought for would live up to the ringing words of the Declaration of Independence. And one of his close friends, William Lloyd Garrison, needed money to start up a newspaper called The Liberator to fight against slavery. And James Fortin gave him some of the seed money to start that newspaper. Now, other black men were enslaved persons who signed on after running away from their owners. And many owners also viewed their enslaved individuals as money-making opportunities. They would rent them out to privateers. Now, this painting was at one time, it's hard, a little hard to see, this painting at one time was thought to be the only known painting of a black privateersman during the American Revolution. It was owned by a urologist in uh, Rhode Island, uh, whose son I happen to know, and his son went to Brown. And uh, anyway, uh, this, this used to be a uh, painting that was put in many books about black individuals' participation in the American Revolution. And France's Tavern, which is in New York City, wanted to have an exhibition in the early 2000s to celebrate the contribution of black individuals to the winning of the American Revolution. And they wanted to use this painting as the centerpiece of their exhibition. So the urologist sent the painting out to an art conservator to have it fixed up a little bit. The art conservator took out a, an appropriate solvent, started wiping the hand, off came the black paint, revealing a white hand beneath. It turns out that sometime in the mid 20th century, somebody who realized that a painting of a unique painting of a black privateersman would be worth much more than a painting of a white mariner during the American Revolution doctored it. Well, Francis Tavern decided not to use it in their exhibition, and the value of the painting plummeted from $300,000 to $3,000. But uh, it, uh, it went back to the urologist's living room, and his son, Christian McBurney, actually wrote a book which just came out last month called Dark Voyage, which is all about how privateers during the American Revolution contributed to uh, various aspects of the slave trade. And I think it's, it's a really interesting book, and he helped me with my research. And that's what I was going to talk about here. There were those men who were treated as property. When privateers captured uh, slave ships, British slave ships off the western coast of Africa, they didn't emancipate the human cargo. They sold it in the colonies and in the Caribbean, transforming privateers into slave traders. Now, many have argued that privateersmen were motivated more by greed than patriotism. John Paul Jones, shown here, believed that it was nothing but greed. A less cynical assessment views privateersmen as being motivated by a combination of profits and patriotism, and I think that view is closer to the truth. Now, a lot of you are from Barnstable. Do you know who this is? Yes, Mercy Otis Warden. Okay, part of the reason privateering was scorned was that many people believe that the practice undermined the Republican ideals of the revolution, which called for the sacrifice of private interests in the pursuit of liberty. According to Mercy Otis Warren, author of one of the earliest histories of the revolution, privateering had a tendency to contract the mind and led it to shrink into selfish views and indulgencies, totally inconsistent with genuine republicanism. Many of the founding fathers and mothers and other elites would have agreed in theory. In practice, however, many elites had a much more complex view of patriotism, one that wasn't based on hewing to Republican ideals above all else. The majority of delegates to Congress clearly believed that privateering was a patriotic endeavor that served the public good. They made it a major part of America's war strategy, fully aware that it was making some of them, including themselves, rich. Now, I'm sorry to dispute Mercy Otis Warren in front of this audience, but she did a lot of great things, but I don't agree with her estimation of privateersmen. But anyway, 
Now, had Congress deemed that privateering worked against the public good or that it wasn't a net benefit to the war effort, it could have, entertained, it could have ended the process immediately, but it never entertained that thought. That's because the delegates and many other political leaders didn't view patriotism and the pursuit of profit as mutually exclusive. Now, the argument that privateers were in it only for the money implies that others involved in the revolution were not, and that is absolutely not true. While the men who rose up after the Battle of Bunker Hill were burning with patriotic fervor, that fire was difficult to maintain for many soldiers in the later years of the war. The only way that Congress could maintain a semblance of a fighting force was to use cash bonuses and the promises of land to keep men on the front lines. The Navy was no different. The mariners who joined the State Navy, the Continental Navy, and Washington's Navy all were motivated partially by money. Each of the naval services offered men a cut of the profits in addition to their base salaries because few would have joined otherwise. This broadside was put together by John Paul Jones and was posted all around Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It could have just as easily been a broadside to recruit people for a privateer. One of the sentences within it said that this would give men an opportunity to distinguish themselves in the glorious cause of their country and to make their fortunes. Now, the perspective of most privateersmen is best reflected in the comments of privateersman and soldier Christopher Prince, who said, looking back on his revolutionary career, through the whole course of the war, I have had two motives in view. One was the freedom of my country, and the other was the luxuries of life. Now, privateers experienced many triumphs and tragedies during the war. One of the most successful privateers was the Hulker out of Philadelphia. Over a span of four years, it had 11 captains and captured more than 70 British prizes. During one particularly successful cruise, it captured 11 British prizes that sold in Philadelphia for $2 million. Now, one of the worst tragedies to befall privateers occurred during the Penobscot Expedition, the largest American maritime force assembled during the Revolution. Now, I knew nothing about the Penobscot Expedition before I started work on this book. In fact, I knew nothing about almost everything in this book because every single book that I've written, except for one, which was on sewage treatment, is about a topic that I knew little about. And the reason I knew a lot about sewage treatment is not because I have a toilet in my house, but because my PhD dissertation was on the cleanup of Boston Harbor. So it was basically 350 years of sewage treatment history. But the rest, the rest of the books are topics that I didn't know a lot about. And uh, you may think that's because I don't know a lot about a lot of things, which is perhaps true. But it's really because the last history class I took was when I was a freshman at Brown. And I wasn't that well read in history, so almost all these topics that I come up with are ones that I don't have a deep amount of knowledge in. And writing a book is like getting a master's degree in the topic, and I'm bound to be excited by finding new information all the time. So anyway, getting back to the Penobscot Expedition, one of the most fascinating pieces of the book that I learned about, it was a, an expedition that consisted of 19 warships, 12 of which were privateers. Their mission was to dislodge the French who had built a fort, Fort George, in what is presently Castine, Maine, in Penobscot Bay. The expedition sailed from Boston on July 19, 1779. Poor organization and leadership and a critical delay in launching the attack led to a fiasco when on August 14th, the Royal Navy arrived at the mouth of the Penobscot Bay. It was a complete rout. In the end, 16 American ships were burned by their own men to keep them from falling into British hands, and the rest were captured or sunk. And since all the ships had been primed for battle, as they burned, the cannons exploded, creating a fireworks display. What's interesting is more recently, up in Maine, they've done some archaeological uh, studies, and they have found the remains of some of these ships in the Penobscot River. Now, as for the men, they bolted into the woods and tried to find their way back to southern Massachusetts, because Maine was part of Massachusetts, and New Hampshire before starving. How many Americans died during the siege of Penobscot and their precipitous flight is not known with any accuracy? The lowest estimate is about 33. The highest estimate is nearly 500, and I think the higher estimate is closer to the right one. And many have labeled it the most devastating naval defeat 
that the United States suffered up until the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th of 1941. Now, one of the most important things that privateers did during the revolution was to help bring France into the war on the American side. In the early years of the war, France allowed American privateers in the Caribbean and in France to use their ports, reprovision, and sell prizes. All of this was an express violation of treaties that France and Great Britain had going back to the early 1700s. That, plus the damage done by the privateers, infuriated the British. The Continental Congress sent William Bingham to the French colony of Martinique, where a large part of his job was to encourage and extend American privateering efforts. And it worked brilliantly. In 1778, it was estimated that American privateers had captured 250 British ships in the Caribbean alone. And trade to that area had plummeted by 66%. And keep in mind that Great Britain's trade with its sugar plantations was its number one source of foreign money coming into the country, much more important than the colonies. Now, so alarming were these uh, horrific figures that the Earl of Suffolk urged Parliament to keep them from the public, pointing out the impropriety of acknowledging what ought not to be acknowledged at so critical a period, the weakness of the nation. Now, meanwhile, Benjamin Franklin, who seemed to be everywhere during the American Revolution, was in France to nego negotiate a formal alliance. He was convinced that privateering was helping the American cause with the British while at the same time, helping the American cause of the French, while at the same time injuring Britain. That which makes the greatest impression in our favor here, Franklin wrote, is the prodigious success of our armed ships and privateers. London's public advertiser asserted that if France continued to allow American privateers to sail from French ports, an immediate war between France and this country will be the inevitable consequence. Now, the critical turning point in getting France to ally with the American cause, of course, was the brilliant victory over General John Burgoyne's British Army at the Battle of Saratoga on October 17, 1777. Privateering, while not causing a sharp turn in America's fortunes on its own, helped to create the situation in, in which this great American victory could prove decisive in bringing France into the conflict. It did so by greatly increasing the enmity between France and Britain and also inflicting serious damage on the British economy. Now, arguably, the most horrific chapter in the American Revolution concerns the British prisons in England and in New York. In both places, American privateersmen made up the bulk of the prison population. The two main prisons in Britain were called Mill and Fortin. Together, they held about 3,000 men during the entirety of the war, and the death rate was about 3 to 6 percent, which is on par with other prisons during this era. Now, Mill and Fortin prisons were bad enough, but by far the worst experience any combatant had to endure was a stay on one of the prison ships in New York City. Between 15,000 and 22,000 men were held on these ships. All of the prison ships were dreadful, but the Jersey was by far the worst. Nicknamed Hell Afloat, the Jersey had been a fourth-rate 64-gun British warship, the largest of the, British, of the British prison ships. The Jersey held at any one time between 850 and 1,200 prisoners. Between six and 12 men died per day. Every morning, the British would yell down to the below decks, rebels, bring up your dead, and they would. Not only would they bring up their dead, but the rebels were forced to bury them on the shore about 200 yards away. And when bad weather came, the shallow graves were uncovered and the decaying bodies were washed into the, sh into the surf. So basically, the one hour a day that they were allowed on the top of the, uh, the ship on the main deck, they were allowed to see what their future might in fact be. Now, one inmate left the following damning portrait of his time on board the Jersey. There were about 1,100 prisoners on board. There were no berths or seats to lie down on, not a bench to sit on. Many were almost without clothes. The dysentery, fever, frenzy, and despair prevailed among them and filled the place with filth, disgust, and horror. 
the scantiness of the allowance, the bad quality of the provisions, the brutality of the guards, and the sick pining for comforts they could not obtain, altogether furnished continually one of the greatest scenes of human distress and misery ever beheld. Just to give you a little idea of the eating opportunities that these prisoners had, they had a huge copper tank on the main deck where they would cook the already rotten meat. They would cook the rotten meat in salt water. That salt water was siphoned up from right next to the ship, the very same spot where they threw everything from the prisoners overboard. So not only were they eating rotten meat that was boiling in horrifically polluted water, but the response of the copper to the salt water and the heat caused copper to enter solution, so they were also being poisoned a little bit with heavy metals. Anyway, the number of deaths on the Jersey alone is shocking. The best estimates points to it being roughly 11,500 men. To put that in perspective, the number of men who died in the direct line of fire on land during the American Revolution was between 4,400 and 6,800. Now, one of the biggest criticisms of privateers is that they siphon men, ammunition, and cannons from the Continental Navy. This is absolutely true. Many men chose to become privateers rather than to go into the Navy, in part because they had the opportunity, perhaps, to earn more money. But that doesn't mean, had there been no Navy, had there been no privateers, that the Continental Navy would have suddenly been transformed into a fearsome fighting force. There are roughly 60 Continental Navy ships on the Atlantic during the American Revolution. Building and assembling a Navy from scratch would have been a gargantuan task for a well-functioning, well-funded government. For the Continental Congress, it was an insurmountable task. Not only were they having a tough time hurting the 13 colonies, which were a little bit like cats or independent countries, but they also had no opportunity to levy taxes. So they had a tough time coming up with the millions of dollars that it cost to buy and build the Navy. Now, the Continental Navy's record in battle is not an enviable one. 28 vessels were captured or destroyed, and many others were lost at sea, sold, returned to France, or burned to keep them from being taken by the enemy. At war's end, just a few Navy ships were left. There were, however, some bright spots for the American Navy. Raids on Caribbean munitions depots brought back much-needed gunpowder. Navy ships did an excellent job of ferrying diplomats and documents across the Atlantic, and they captured roughly 200 prizes. Nevertheless, in July of 1780, John Adams reflected on the fortunes of the Continental Navy, writing, in looking over the long list of vessels belonging to the United States, taken and destroyed, and recollecting the whole history of the rise and progress of our Navy, it is very difficult to avoid tears. The American Revolution was the Navy's first hour, but not its finest. If there had been no privateers, the Navy would have certainly had more men to draw upon. It would have had more ammunition, and it would have had more cannons. But the absence of privateers would not have meant, would not have meant a larger and significantly more effective Navy. Congress would not have somehow been able to come up with more money to spend on it. Now, while we may have preferred to have a well-functioning Navy, that was not an option. And in that, into that void went the privateers. They were the best alternative we had available. They were essentially a cost-free Navy or a militia of the sea. We're almost done. On the home front, privateers contributed materially to the American economy. Privateering was an economic boon for coastal communities, keeping many businesses afloat during the war and creating new ones as well as new fortunes. And the money that privateersmen earned helped them to support their families and also gave a jolt to the local economies. Each prize auction delivered a stream of commodities into the colonies that they were desperately needed. A thankful Pennsylvanian told Congress in August of 1779 that privateers have rendered us the most essential services and brought us many articles for public and private use, without which the war could hardly have been supported. Privateering also had a psychological impact. During the American Revolution, there were 30 newspapers published throughout the colonies. They had thousands of articles on privateering. In 
Some of them were negative, but many of them were positive. That coverage gave people confidence that the larger war might still be won, which was particularly important during those long stretches in the first few years when almost all the news from the land-based war was horrific or disastrous. Now, the formal end of the war came on September 3rd of 1783, when the Treaty of Paris was signed. Surviving privateers that had been merchantmen before the war now reverted to form, while those vessels built for privateering were refitted as merchantmen. These ships now played their part in transporting America's wares to distant ports, proudly flying the new nation's flag. And one of the interesting things I found in writing this book was a connection to an earlier book that I wrote called When America First Met China, which is all about the American-China trade after the revolution up through the Civil War. I had no idea that a lot of the men and the ships that launched our trade with China were privateers and privateer owners during the American Revolution, the most famous of which is Elias Haskett Derby of Salem, who was the first millionaire in America's history, purportedly. And uh, he built the Grand Turk, a privateer that had more than 30 cannons during the American Revolution. And right after the American Revolution, he turned the Grand Turk into a China trader. And it was one of the first ships to go to Canton. Now, the men who owned and financed privateers, as well as those who had chosen to fight, their, fight for their country on the decks of these vessels, looked back on their accomplishments with pride and wondered, as did all Americans, what the future would bring for themselves and their new country. And with that, I'm done. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. <laughs> and thanks for coming. Yeah, that, I guess that sounded a little more abrupt than it should have. I'm done. I'm not writing another book. I'm leaving. I'm leaving Cape Cod right away. <laughs> so, yes? Well, so, some people, a guy named Blair McClanahan, who was an owner of privateers, including the Hulker, in Philadelphia was dubbed the millionaire maker or the man with the Midas touch because so many of his ship's captains and the men who, who worked on those ships came back and earned a pretty penny. Uh, one of the first two privateers to go out after uh, the Continental Congress uh, approved of privateering was the Chance and the Congress. When they came back from their initial cruise, the captains on board both those ships earned 5,000 pounds, roughly, which was what a substantial merchant of the day would expect to have in their 401k, you know, <laughs> in their, their, their portfolio. So a lot of men did come back and might earn 1,000 pounds, and uh, an average laborer at the time might only earn, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 pounds a year. So it could be a lot, but a lot of privateers not only lost their lives in prisons or were captured or sank or killed at sea, but a lot of privateersmen came back empty-handed. So it wasn't a winning ticket. It was like going into a casino. Some people win. Some people won big. A lot of people lost. But enough people won to keep it a going concern. So, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Ships, yes. Mm -hmm. When they would capture the other boats, did they always sell them, or did the owners uh, start to amass a collection of these boats and then just become larger and larger privateers? Uh, both. Yes, uh, it depends on the owner's inclinations. Many of the ships were sold, uh, but in some cases, they were good enough. They were sold, uh, the, they, these auctions, the owners would have to participate in the auction as well. They couldn't just keep it. It had to be auctioned off. But they could buy their own vessel and, or, or, the, or the goods. And actually, that was a complaint. A lot of privateer owners had deep pockets. And it was complained that they bought a lot of the goods that should have gone to the Navy or the Army. And there's some truth to that. But uh, yeah, sometimes they kept them, sort of like pirates. In my book, Black Flags, Blue Waters, pirates would capture ships. Sometimes they would keep it to make a little pirate squadron. So if you got a particularly good prize, 
it was often, when it was auctioned off, in the auction paper, in the announcement, in the newspaper, it would say that this ship is very well outfitted, it's well designed, it would make a great privateer, so that would hopefully increase the, uh, the bidding. Yep. Oh, oh go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what the exact highest percentage. A lot of it was off the coast of the colonies, particularly in the transit lanes between New York, which was in British control, and England. A lot of it was in the Caribbean, getting the trade between Great Britain and their sugar islands. A lot of it was off the western coast of Africa, and quite a bit of it was in the English Channel and the Bay of Biscay and off France and uh, Spain. So they operated wherever there was potential prey. And sometimes very small boats. There was, this, there was a ferry boat that used to operate in the Chesapeake that was probably a 45-foot boat that went across and captured a much larger British ship right off of uh, the coast of England. And when the, the, the British captain was totally amazed, not only did this little ship made it across the Atlantic, but outmaneuvered him and captured his ship. So, any other question? You mentioned as an example one ship that was successful had uh, seven captures and one. Yeah. Nothing is the... Uh, Getting them back? Yeah. The yeah. Sailors, so, you know, seven ships. Yeah, it's a lot. A lot of people. What, and what? They also have to deal with the uh, captives. Of yeah, excellent question. What they would do is they'd start out with a big crew, maybe 120 people. And when they caught a prize, they might take seven of their men put it on the prize, pick a prize master, he would sail it back into port. A lot of prisoners would be below decks in manacles. Other prisoners would be kept on the privateer. Sometimes they ransomed the prisoners and let them go on another ship, or even the ship that they captured. That was done on occasion. But what happened is through a game of attrition, the more successful you were, the smaller your crew became, and it finally became a point of diminishing returns, so you couldn't capture another prize. You had to go back into port and replenish. And sometimes, um, sometimes Americans did not calculate properly. There was a ship called the Eagle out of New London that was very successful uh, off the coast of Rhode Island and Connecticut. And it captured a number of prizes. And at one point, the Eagle had 16 men on board, but 17 British prisoners. The British prisoners conspired, got free, took over the ship, killed all the Americans, except for two boys, which were probably 12 or 13-year-old kids. And then they sailed the Eagle into British-held Newport. So yes, it could be very dangerous if you depleted your ranks too much. And there are stories of Americans, who are American privateers who were captured, who rose up and uh, took over the ship from the British captors. And there are stories of uh, British prisoners rising up and taking back their own ships or another ship that they were put on. Yeah. How long did privateering go on? Well, it was basically the entire American Revolution. It started in 1775, went through 1783. In fact, there were a couple of privateers who didn't get the word fast enough when the war ended, and they kept capturing British ships. And there's one, actually, Elias Haskett Derby, the, uh, the Grand Turk, uh, captured a ship called the Pompey, and this was after American privateer licenses had been yanked, but they were at sea and they hadn't heard it. So they captured the Pompey. The Pompey, the captain of the Pompey, was shocked because he knew the war was over and he knew that these things had been rescinded, so he didn't try to flee when this American ship took him over. He couldn't convince the guy that the war had ended, so they took the Pompey back to Salem. And of course, of course, I don't know, I don't know if they were corrupt. But even, even with that information in front of them and the owners of the Pompeii protesting, the Salem court, a judge judged it a valid prize, and Eliot Haskett Derby got to keep, keep the Pompeii and all of its cargo. So, too bad. All's fair in love and war, I guess, you know. Yeah. How did they know what ship they were confronting? They're, they're out of sea, there was no... A lot of times they didn't. Uh, basically what they would do is they get close enough 
They could look. If there was a flag up, they had some idea. But a lot of times, there was something called ruse de guerre, which is false flag. So you couldn't always depend on the flag. Usually what would happen is you would get close enough so you could use your speaking trumpet or yell over, who are you? And depending on the answer, you would decide what to do. And if you were really a more powerful ship, which you would try to scope it out first, you would ask them to send over their longboat or their shallop or whatever they had with a couple of men on board and the papers to the ship to prove who they were. But there were many times when they got close enough and they discovered they were enemies and they just started pummeling each other with cannon fire. It, was, it took a lot of guts to go to sea any time in the 1700s. It took even more guts, I think, to go to sea during a time of war, just like it took guts to fight in the Continental Army. And uh, the founding fathers you know, were treasonous in the eyes of Britain. And if we had lost the war, a lot of people would have been in severe pain, if not hanged. So I often wonder, what would I have done if I had been alive during the American Revolution? I'd like to think that I would have fought for my country. But all I could tell you is that it's much easier being a writer than <laughs> doing any of that stuff. <laughs> but I'm very happy that we have a military today, <laughs> given the way the world is. But anyway. um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. And I would like to uh, invite you to um, purchase a book from Kickcom's bookshop and to talk to Eric and join us for sure um, for dessert. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>